Eric Christian writes, if you didn't succeed, it's just as important to keep in mind that there has never been a success story without failure and lessons along the way. There's never been a success story without a failure preceding it. Have you ever failed at anything? You ever done something that you just knew ahead of time was a really great idea? Maybe it seemed like a fail-proof plan. But then when you actually did it, it failed miserably. Ever happened to you? Don't lie. It's happened to all of us. And then, of course, depending on how big of a failure it was, you spend the next several weeks or months or sometimes even years trying to figure out what went wrong, right? Maybe it was a business venture, uh, maybe a new relationship or a, a ministry. Maybe it was a really hard decision that you had to make, and at the time you felt like you were making the right one, but it ended in failure. Maybe it was just as simple as deciding to do something really great for someone else, but it backfired and ended up in a real mess, right? No good deed goes unpunished. The fact is, we've all experienced failure at times in our lives. We all fall down. We all fall short of the mark. We all make decisions at times that end in failure. And those experiences are always a part of what shapes us and what shapes our future, which is why, as much as God loves us, it's why he allows us to fall down. It's why he allows us to make mistakes. The truth is, sometimes God allows us to fail. The, the fact is, God will gladly allow you to get to the end of yourself, if that's what it takes, to get you where he wants you to be. Why? Because he loves you. He allows us to fail, because that is one of the ways we grow and mature, and most of all, that's one of the ways we learn to rely on him through our failures. I'm convinced, look, I'm convinced the most successful people in life are those who have failed the most or at least those who've been willing to fail the most and still keep moving forward. In fact, the only kind of failure that is a complete waste is the kind we don't learn from because failure is always an opportunity to learn something valuable. And like bricks in a foundation, every failure can be a building block that our future successes are built upon. Of course, nobody, we don't set out to fail, right? No one wants to fail, no one looks forward to failing, but we all do. Everyone fails at times in life, yet there's always hope for success after failure because there's always something positive, something productive, something useful to learn from every single failure in our lives, which is why you'll find that great successes in people's lives are always preceded by some measure of failure first. That's a fact. You look at any uber successful person and you will find whatever they're successful in, there were many failures that preceded that success, right? Children don't learn how to walk without falling down. Fighters don't learn how to fight without getting hit. And we will never experience great success in our own lives without experiencing some amount of failure first. And so the key to making the most out of a failure in your life is first of all to recognize why you failed, which usually requires a lot of honest introspection, sometimes painful self-reflection, but once you identify the reasons you failed, then you have a choice to make. You can either give up or you can go forward. You can decide it isn't worth it, the failure is too painful, too risky, too hard to deal with and give up, or you can do the hard work to address your own mistakes. You can learn from that failure and you can move forward better than you were before, but make no mistake, that's the harder path to take. Having to admit your own failures is hard enough. Correcting them can be even harder. And yet the most difficult part of it all is choosing to keep moving forward, to keep working toward that goal, that calling, that relationship, that ministry, that dream after you've tried and failed miserably, sometimes multiple times. It's what our story is about today as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the book of Joshua as the people of God suffered a catastrophic failure in the last chapter which cost the lives of three dozen of their best fighting men and emboldened their enemies against them. And so at the end of the last chapter, we find the Israelites admitting their mistakes and then dealing with those mistakes. And now they have a choice to make, to try again, to keep moving forward, or to stay right where they are and settle for something far less, which is the very choice that paralyzes so many people today. Stunned by our own failures, Unwilling to admit or correct them, we choose to stay where we are because it feels safer and we don't have to go through the pain of failure again. Which, 
by the way, is absolutely true, right? It's much safer to stay where you are, to live your life avoiding risk, avoiding the possibility of failing again. And that's also a great way of never accomplishing much of anything, never growing through your mistakes, and never experiencing the successes that you could when you're willing to learn from your mistakes and keep trying, keep risking, keep moving forward. And look, historically, the church has been at its best when persecution was at its worst. You ever stop to think about why that is? It's because just being the church in certain parts of the world or in certain periods throughout history meant risking your very life just for following Christ. And so those who were willing to take that risk, even though great failures and losses often followed, they were willing to keep going. It was those Christ followers who experienced successes which are unheard of in other parts of the world or in other periods in history because they're willing to risk great failure, which opened up opportunities for them to experience great success. Think about that. They're willing to risk great failure. It opens up opportunities for you to experience great success. People come to my uh, office all the time. Almost never are they asking for uh, counsel or direction or guidance or advice because everything is going their way. No. No, people come to me when everything is not going their way. And when things are not going their way, we're the most open to the opportunities that God puts before us. I've said it here many times before. You can have great risk without great success. You can have great risk without great success, but you cannot have great success without great risk. Anyone who's truly accomplished anything great in this world has done it at great risk to themselves personally or the organization or whatever the situation was. And listen, I don't, I don't want to wait for intense persecution to break out before the church really becomes effective in our culture or our community today. No, I want us to achieve great successes for the kingdom of God now. Successes that people write about and talk about for generations to come because they were so profound <laughs> in our culture or our community, but that means being willing to learn from our past failures instead of giving up and choosing the easy way, the comfortable way, the safe way. It means learning from our failures when we're knocked down and then getting right back up again and moving forward better than we were before. That's true for the church and it's true in your life personally. There's no better example of that in scripture than in our story today. So let's turn there together to Joshua chapter eight and we'll begin by reading verses one and two. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. Okay, these two verses, especially the very first thing that God says to Joshua in verse 1 are indispensable when it comes to understanding God's disposition toward us after we failed miserably. Okay, during the attack on Jericho, which you'll remember from last week, an Israelite named Akan took some of the carom, the things devoted for destruction in direct disobedience to the command of God given through Joshua. And then immediately following that, Joshua, without the counsel of God, decides to attack another city to the west called Ai because it would be a better base of operations for him and the Israelite army. And the result of all of that was devastating to all of Israel because not only did three dozen of their best fighting men die as they're being chased off by the enemy, but they found out the hard way that they could actually be defeated in Canaan. And as a result, verse 5 of chapter 7 says, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. This is a perfect picture of what happens when we think we have things all figured out. So we act ahead of God or outside of God's will or without the counsel of God. And then as a result, we experience an overwhelming failure. Nothing says it quite like verse 5 of that last chapter. The hearts of the people melted and became as water. And then the following verse says, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Okay, this is full on mourning by Joshua and the leaders of Israel as the rest of the people are in a total state of disbelief and panic. So 
Keep all of that in mind when you read these first two verses in chapter 8. Immediately after the Israelites admit and confront and deal with their mistakes, with their sin at the end of chapter 7, because they're coming undone after this epic failure. But the moment they set things right with God, he says to them, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Look, This is something we all need to pay very close attention to for ourselves because if you're stuck, if you're resigned to remain where you are because of some past failure, you need to hear this and you need to take it to heart. The moment, I mean the moment you admit your mistake and take responsibility for it and repent, which is exactly what Joshua and the people of Israel did here. In that moment, God says to you, do not fear and do not be dismayed. You understand, while we're still reeling from the after effects of our failure, God has moved on. He says, hey, Joshua, come on. It's time to go. Do not fear and do not be dismayed because in spite of your failure, I am with you. You see, we're the ones who get hung up by our mistakes. God doesn't. We get stuck in the past. God doesn't know the moment you admit and repent and deal with those mistakes. God says, okay, enough. Stop talking about it. Stop thinking about it. Stop obsessing over it. Stop using it as an excuse to stay where you are because yesterday is as far from you as the east is from the west. So look, I'm not the one holding you back. In fact, while your heart was melting over your past failure, I was busy securing your future success. So get over it because I have. Let's go. Look, if you've dealt with your mistakes... God is not the one wringing his hands trying to figure out what to do with our failures. He moved on from that long ago, which means it's time for you to move on as well. In the last half of verse 1, right after God tells Joshua to quit worrying about what happened yesterday, he says, See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. In other words, Joshua, while you were freaking out over your failure from yesterday, I was busy securing your success for tomorrow. I moved on. It's time for you to move on as well. Let's keep reading now and find out what God's people learned from their failures. Verses 3 through 9. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. And he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out against us, just as before, we shall flee before them. And they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing from us just as before. So we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you've taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I've commanded you. So Joshua sent them out, and they went to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and I to the west of I. But Joshua spent that night among the people. So Joshua gathers his troops and lays out a detailed strategy, a battle plan to ambush the city by splitting up his army and putting on a great ruse, pretending to be beaten as before, while a second force who is hiding behind the city attacks I once all the enemy soldiers have emptied out of the citadel in pursuit of Joshua and the men who are in front of the city. And at its height of power, it was the early Bronze Age, I, or Etel as it's known today, was a city that covered about 27 acres. It had massive stone walls. They were 25 feet wide and 29 feet high. And in Joshua's time, it wasn't quite as powerful as it once had been. But nonetheless, I was no pushover as Joshua and his spies thought it would be based on their first attempt to take the city. So this new strategy is much more comprehensive and creative and well thought out than the first. And yet the most enlightening part of the entire plan given to them by Joshua is what he says in verse 8. Right after giving them their battle instructions, Joshua says, You shall do according to the word of the Lord. In other words, in case you're wondering how this attack is going to turn out any different than the last one, I just got all of this directly from God himself. 
Okay, the first go around, Joshua acted without the counsel of God, and he paid dearly because of it. But through that failure, he learned something that we all need to learn as well. Failure teaches us to rely on God's voice. Okay, the, the first attack on I, the Israelites were following Joshua's voice, which was woefully inadequate to guide them to victory. The second attack, they're following God's voice as spoken to Joshua, and the result couldn't have been more different, as we're going to see. And the truth is, God's people today do the very same thing and get the very same results. With every failure you go through in life, if you're honest with yourself and willing to walk the difficult road of self-reflection, you will find that somewhere along the way to failure, you missed God's voice. Either you heard it and disobeyed it, or you acted without hearing from him first. And just like Joshua and the Israelites, we can have sin in our lives and not even realize it. Things that God wants us to deal with, to correct, to repent of, to repair in our lives before we take that next step in these big decisions that we make in our careers and ministries and relationships, our finances and families. But we have this great idea, by the way, which may well be God's will for us. But not until we deal with those issues that he wants us to address first, not until Our hearts and minds are ready to receive from him all that we need in order to take that next big step in life. Yet at times we don't seek the counsel of God first. We don't talk to him about it first. We just charge forward without hearing from God and then we're stunned and our hearts melt when we experience a devastating failure. And as a result, there's often an even bigger mistake that many people make at this critical juncture when they experience a significant failure. And that bigger mistake often becomes a defining moment in their lives. They assume that since they failed, they assume that whatever they were after, whatever they were going after, must not have been God's will for them at all because they failed. And so they stop moving toward that goal. They stop moving forward. They shut down. They give up. They assume that God must want them to stay right where they are because whatever they tried was a big failure. And all the while, God's saying, no, no. I want you to move forward. I want you to take that next step. That dream you had, by the way, pal, I put that in your heart. I want you to pursue that next part of the journey, but you weren't ready yet. So hear my voice now, because there are things in your life that I want you to work on first, things that need to be corrected, areas that need to be matured, sin that needs to be dealt with, relationships that need to be repaired. And then listen, the moment The moment you heed my voice and take care of those areas in your life that need some attention, that's when you can go full speed ahead with confidence because while you're working on yourself and where you are now, I'll be preparing an absolute success for you in the very place where you failed before. Right? What would have happened to Joshua? What would have happened to God's people if Joshua said, no, God, I can't go back up to I. I tried that and I failed. So I'm staying right where I am. It was God's plan and intention all along for Joshua and the Israelites to conquer I. God's plan hadn't changed. But see, Joshua did it on his own and it failed miserably. That's exactly what we do when we refuse to learn from our failures, when we refuse to grow, when we refuse to become better, when we stay where we are out of fear of failing again, when all the while God wants us to move forward to take those big risks to make those big decisions, but the key is setting aside time, making the effort. Anytime you have a a big decision, especially before you, you take the time first to pray, to pour your heart out to God, to seek wise counsel, and then you listen to the voice of God before you do anything else. You listen and make sure you've heard from Him before you take that next step, because I'm telling you, uh, look, there isn't one single person in this room who God doesn't have a strategy, a plan for your life that involves you moving forward and experiencing absolute successes in your life, but you'll never get there without the voice of God, without the Spirit speaking to you first. Let's keep reading, verses 10 through 17. Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai, And all the fighting men who were with them went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai with a ravine between them and Ai. 
He took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and I to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. So the plan that was spoken to Joshua by God so far is working to perfection. Joshua gets up early, probably before first light, and along with the elders who were the heads of the different clans and families, they were the tribal leaders who would function as military officers in battle. They went with Joshua to lead the people right past the entrance of Ai northward, where they make their camp in preparations for battle, making certain that the people of Ai see them pass by the front of the city in anticipation of an impending attack. And then Joshua covertly positions part of his army, a much smaller force between Ai and Bethel to the west, which was behind Ai to wait in ambush. And there they spend the night. And then again, probably before dawn the next morning, verse 14 says, as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabah to meet Israel in battle. The Arabah is the great rift valley where Jericho, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea are all located. So the two armies are heading out toward the valley where the battle will presumably take place. And honestly, it reads like a movie script, especially if you pay attention to the details, because I was basically a satellite city of a much larger city called Bethel, just to the west. Bethel, it's the modern day town, Beitin today, was an important city uh, in biblical times. Abraham offered a sacrifice to God there in Genesis 12 and 13. Jacob had a dream from God there in Genesis 28, and it remained an important Canaanite city for centuries, long before the Israelites ever arrived at Canaan. And so an attack on Ai was essentially an attack on Bethel, which was only three kilometers west of Ai. It's less than two miles. So as you would expect, we learn in verse 17 that as the men of Ai were moving out of the city to engage Israel in battle, the men of Bethel were also moving out of their city to fight alongside the men of Ai. But here's where it gets really interesting, because the men of Bethel would have had to march right past the 5,000 troops who were hiding in ambush between Ai and Bethel in order to engage the main Israelite force who were with Joshua in the Arabah. And keep in mind, Bethel and I were in what is the modern day West Bank. It's rugged mountainous terrain full of huge rocks and hills and ravines and depressions. So as the troops of Bethel are marching out in the pre-dawn hours to get to the battlefield, they march right past 5,000 Israelite soldiers who were hiding probably everywhere they could as the entire force from Bethel passes by unaware that they're marching their way right through 5,000 enemy troops directly into a trap. And so the main Israelite force, along with Joshua, pretend to be beaten. They retreat toward the wilderness of the valley, which emboldens the armies of Ai and Bethel to give chase, leaving those cities completely devoid of anyone capable of defending them, right? This is the stuff movies are made of. And although we aren't given a lot of detail about the fate of Bethel, we know from Joshua chapter 12, verse 16, that the king of Bethel was among those slain by Joshua. And so it's probably safe to assume that Bethel was taken at the same time uh, as I. It's just that the story focuses on I because that's where Joshua sent the Israelites into defeat in the previous chapter. So let's keep reading and find out what happens next. Verses 18 through 23. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward I, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to the heavens. And they had no power to flee this way or that. For the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. 
and the others came out from the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. And Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him near to Joshua. So the plan unfolds precisely as God designed it to as Joshua's force is retreating. He signals the ambush forces to take the city by raising his javelin when the Lord instructs him that it's time. The word uh, javelin in verse 18 is the ancient Hebrew word kidon. It's the same word used in uh, 1 Samuel 17 to describe Goliath's bronze javelin, which was actually more of a sword than what we think of as a javelin today. It was a, 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 a scimitar, the short, heavy, cor- curved sword that was common in the second millennium B.C., which Joshua holds up in the air to signal the forces waiting in ambush to attack the citadel at Ai. And so they get up and enter the city and set it on fire, which sends the enemy troops into complete confusion. And so seizing on the moment, all at once, the ambush force moves out of Ai to attack the enemy from the city, while Joshua and the main force of Israelites turn back to attack the enemy from the wilderness. And just like that, the soldiers of Ai and Bethel find themselves in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. In other words, they're completely surrounded. And Israel struck them down until there was none left who survived or escaped. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him near to Joshua. I mean, what a stunning turn of events from that first attack on Ai to this one. The stark contrast between Joshua's plan on their first attempt And God's plan on this attempt could not have been more pronounced than it is here as Israel goes from total failure to total success and in the process learns a lesson they wouldn't soon forget. Failure teaches us to rely on God's plan. There were numerous points throughout this entire battle sequence and the events leading up to it where the Israelites could have easily abandoned the plan. First of all, they marched right past the front of the city just to let the enemy know they were there. They could have easily provoked an attack before the Israelites were prepared. Then 5,000 of Joshua's men had to secretly move to hostile territory and hide directly between two enemy cities overnight without being detected, which would mean no fires, no movement, no talking, no nothing for a long time. Then those same troops had to muster the nerve to remain hidden and silent as the entire army of Bethel marches right through their position, right past them on the way to meet up with the army of Ai. Then the troops with Joshua had to rely on the much smaller ambush force to successfully destroy the city very quickly before Joshua's forces ran out of places to run away from the enemy who was chasing them the whole time. And after all of that, they still had to turn and face and fight an enemy who very recently defeated them soundly, and yet every single part of it worked because they learned to trust in God's plan. Now, think about that. God's plan on the surface would seem to be far riskier than Joshua's plan, right? Joshua sent an invading force by surprise to attack I head on while God's plan has them marching around past the front gates of the city, hiding out, running away, and tricking the enemy into an ambush. But you know what? God never said his plans for our lives were risk-free. He never said we wouldn't face danger. He never said it, wouldn't always, uh, it would always make sense to us. He never said it would be easy. And he never said we wouldn't fail along the way. But you know what is infinitely more meaningful than anything he didn't say? It's what he did say. He said, do not fear and do not be dismayed, verse 1. He said, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, 10. He said, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. You see, failure isn't the end of anything. If you're willing to follow God's plan, failure's just the beginning. King Solomon wrote, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs 19, 21. Look, there's nothing better than discovering God's plan for your life. I can testify to that firsthand, and yet nothing will open your heart and mind to the possibilities of God's plan for your life more than when your own plans for your life fail miserably. It's what I said a few minutes ago. People never come to me Seeking God's direction when everything's going as planned. I never see you. You should come sometime. No, people come when they're in trouble. When they failed. 
when nothing's going as planned, when everything's falling apart, when they can't see what's around the corner. All of a sudden, they open their hearts and minds to whatever God is leading them to. Nothing will open your heart and mind to the possibilities of God's plan for your life more than when you fail miserably. It's when we open ourselves up to the possibilities more than any other time. See, sometimes uh, we get in our own way. And so God allows that to play out in our lives until our plans fail. He say, no, God, I'm going to do it this way. He says, okay, go ahead. You come back to me when that doesn't work out. He doesn't do it to bring us to an end. He does it to bring us to a new beginning, one where we've learned to rely on his plans no matter the risk, no matter the danger, and no matter the unknowns, because relying on his plan for your life is the only pathway to true success. Nevertheless, a lot of people believe their past failures have led them to an end that they cannot recover from. It's what Joshua must have thought, otherwise God would never have said to him, do not fear and do not be dismayed. If Joshua wasn't afraid and dismayed, God wouldn't have said it. And then he followed it up with, see, Joshua, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. Okay, success belonged to Joshua before he ever took one step in the direction of Ai once he learned to rely on God's plan instead of his own. George W. Truett once said, there is no failure in God's will and no success outside of God's will. Let's continue verses 24 through 29. When Israel had finished killing all the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness where they pursued them, and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword, Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he had stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. Only the livestock and the spoil of that, city, uh, of that city Israel took as their plunder, according to the word of the Lord that he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins as it is to this day. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day. So the people of Ai were considered Kerem or things to be devoted to destruction. We talked about that at length last week, so I'm not going to go through all of that again today, other than to say that the gruesome nature of the wholesale slaughter of an entire city, men, women, and children, underscores the disposition of a holy God toward blatant rebellion and sin, which these cities were certainly guilt guilty of. At some point through this series, maybe I'll read to you, some of what is written about what the Canaanites would do on a regular basis, including eating their own children in human sacrifice. It was unbelievable the way they lived and the gods, the pagan gods they worshipped. And lest we think it unfair, then that this was just toward those who were non-Jews only. By the way, Akan, one of their own, you'll remember from last week, and his entire family met the exact same fate for his own blatant rebellion and sin in the last chapter. In fact, his body was treated exactly the same way as the king of Ai's body is here, thrown down and covered with a heap of stones. Right? I said last week, I think if you're not, uh, if you're confounded by the consequences of sin, then you're not confounded by sin. Right? If you're confounded by the consequences we face for our sin, then you're not confounded by sin. And of course, we, we need look no further than Jesus Christ himself and the death that he suffered to satisfy the wrath of a holy God toward blatant rebellion and sin as well. We, we have to understand God is holy and he's just and he's consistent in his treatment of rebellion and sin. The difference for us, of course, is that Jesus Christ took the wrath for our own sin upon himself. He paid our penalty so that we could live. But God is still holy. God is still just. And God still hates sin as much as he ever has. Which means our treatment of sin should be as ruthless as Joshua's treatment of I. We put sin to death in our own lives without mercy. The Apostle Paul said, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Romans 8, 13. Sin is as serious to God now as it ever has been. And it should be to us as well. 
Yet because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, we can still have success even after our greatest failure. Let's finish our story for today. Verse 30 to the end of the chapter. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the book of the Law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the Law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So Joshua goes up to Mount Ebal, which is just north of Shechem, to renew the covenant with God by building an altar and offering sacrifices there as the people stood on either side of the Ark of the Covenant between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, which sounds like it would be a long way apart, but uh, actually the bases of those two mountains is only about 500 yards apart. So you can imagine two and a half million people there in the valley between the two mountains with the Ark as Joshua follows the written law of Moses down to the last detail as laid out for them in Deuteronomy 27, 1 through 13. They build an altar of unhewn or uncut stones, according to verses 5 through 7 in Deuteronomy 27. Then Joshua writes the law on the stones, according to verse 8. They offer burnt offerings, according to verses 6 and 7. And then in verses 34 and 35 of our text here in Joshua, it says that he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. Okay, Joshua... And the Israelites are reaffirming the covenant and their commitment to the word of God, which we've seen all the way through this chapter because failure teaches us to rely on God's word. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, you need to know something about these verses 30 through 35, which I'll explain and then I'll explain to you why they're pertinent here. Uh, Most English translations of the Bible that we have today, including the ESV that we use, it's the translation that Jesus uses, um, use the, that was a joke, use the, the, the Masoretic text as the basis for the Old Testament. The Masoretic text is named after a group of Levitical scholars and scribes called the Masoretes who compiled Old Testament manuscripts between the 7th and 10th centuries AD. But then between 1946 and 1956, the Qumran scrolls or the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by Bedouin shepherds and later along with archaeologists in the Qumran caves near the Dead Sea. And included in those scrolls, we have manuscripts from every book of the Old Testament minus the book of Esther. And so here's where it gets interesting. The Dead Sea Scrolls are about a thousand years older than the Masoretic text, meaning they were written down a thousand years closer to the time of these events in Joshua than the Masoretic texts were, which makes any differences that may occur between the two different texts uh, probably worth paying attention to, right? Now, I want to be clear about something because there's been a lot made about the differences between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic texts over the years by people who who would love nothing more than to discredit the historical accuracy of the Bible, when in reality, over 95% of the two different texts are identical, which is astounding when you consider the fact that there's a thousand years between them. You ever play the game in school where the teacher whispers something in your ear and you go around in a circle and you whisper it to the next person and then when it gets back around to the last person, you repeat it and it's nothing like what the teacher first said to you. I mean, we can't get through 12 people without changing the story. There's a thousand years. Hebrew scholar Miller Burroughs said it this way. He said, I'm quoting, it is a matter of wonder that through something like 1,000 years, the text underwent so little alteration. As I said in my first article on the scroll, herein lies its chief importance, supporting the fidelity 
of the Masoretic text uh, tradition. Likewise, the late Gleason Archer, one of the most respected Old Testament scholars of all time, he wrote, even though the two copies of Isaiah discovered in Qumran Cave 1 near the Dead Sea in 1947 were a thousand years earlier than the oldest dated manuscript previously known, 8980, they proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. Listen to this. The 5% of variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. And so despite the claims of some biblical detractors, the two texts basically agree on almost all points. However, there are some noteworthy differences, including one that involves these last six verses in Joshua chapter 8 that we just read, which is why I just went through all of that, because the Dead Sea Scrolls place these verses just before Joshua chapter 5 and verse 2, instead of here at the end of chapter 8. And so if the placement of these verses in the Qumran version, the Dead Sea Scrolls version, is correct, that means Joshua and the Israelites renewed the covenant and made these sacrifices the same day they crossed over the Jordan River, just before circumcising the men of Israel and then celebrating the Passover, which actually makes a lot more sense if you go back to Deuteronomy 27, where Moses tells them to do everything they're now doing at Mount Ebal, but he also tells them to do it on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord God is giving you, Deuteronomy 27, 2. It basically corrects what may be a, a chronological error in the Masoretic text. By the way, none of that changes anything theologically or doctrinally with the book of Joshua. In fact, it doesn't change the message of this sermon either, which I'm going to show you in a moment, but I wanted to cover that with you today because it makes much better sense out of the text when reading it with Deuteronomy 27 in mind, which, by the way, we should always do when we're reading this part of Joshua. And it clears up the question that many wondered before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls as to why Joshua and the people did not obey Moses' command immediately after crossing over the Jordan, even though they've been obeying in every other way. Now, again, it doesn't change the point, that the bigger point here, that through their failure... The Israelites were learning to rely on God's word because all throughout the second battle at Ai, we find Joshua doing just that, relying on God's word every step of the way. Okay, we know they pulled off an elaborate ambush, and although using a military ambush in battle was certainly not unheard of at the time, we, we have 13th century B.C. Egyptian writings and 10th century B.C. Assyrian writings that describe ambush strategies similar to the one used here by Joshua. And yet we know this wasn't just Joshua being a clever military commander because again in verse 8, after describing the plan, Joshua said to the people, you shall do according to the word of the Lord. Likewise, hanging enemy rulers on a tree, which by the way actually meant impaling them on a wooden pole when they talk about uh, hanging in most cases in the Old Testament. It was a long, tall wooden pole sharpened at one end and they would spread the person's legs apart and pull them down over the pole and mount the pole in the ground and that's how they would hang for everyone to see. It was gruesome. Uh, Joshua did this with the king of Ai. We know that was common practice in, in ancient Near Eastern warfare. The 7th and 8th century BC Assyrian king uh, uh, Sennacherib wrote about how he executed the rulers of Ekron and then he said, I hung their corpses on poles around the city. It was a common practice. The difference with Joshua is that he's careful to recognize God's word even in the matters concerning these dead bodies. Verse 29 says at sunset, Joshua commanded and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city, talking about the king of Ai, and raised it over, over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day. So Joshua had the body taken down before nightfall, according to the word of God in Deuteronomy 21, which commanded that any dead body hung on a tree must be taken down and buried before dark on the same day that it was hung on the tree. These are all details that show Joshua's renewed attention to the word of God in every single decision he makes. Why? Because he just recently experienced the alternative. And so as crazy as all of this might have sounded to Joshua, it didn't matter because he's already tried it his way. Now he's following God's word to a T, all right? When we veer away from God's word, even when it appears that our success is assured, when we depart from the word of God and begin making life decisions that are contrary to his word, we set ourselves on a collision course with failure. 
I could be the president of that club. My wife says I'm the most impatient person on earth. I have all kinds of plans. I have the best ideas in the world. I have them all the time. My problem is I convince myself it's the best plan in the world and I charge for it and I can knock over buildings and people because once I decide I'm doing something, look out, that's what I'm doing. But if it's not in God's timing, it's guaranteed to end in failure. And fortunately, I have a wife who listens to the Holy Spirit and can pull me back. The timing isn't right, right? There's no replacement for the word of God as a guide for our lives. There's nothing else in the world that we can rely on to lead us to success like the word of God. Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and what? Keep it. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, he said, the word of God is what we live our lives by. Matthew 40, uh, 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word of God sustains us, guides us, and protects us. Solomon said, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him, Proverbs 35. The fact is, the word of God is absolutely trustworthy so that when the battles in life come, and we all know they will, we can unequivocally rely upon his word to guide us through those difficult times, or or we can improvise like Joshua did the first time around. And you'll find out quickly, just like he did, the only thing that awaits us outside of God's word in this life is failure, dysfunction, and ultimately defeat. King David wrote, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119, 105. In other words, every step that I take in this life is guided by your word. And yet we know there was great failure in David's own life. Okay, the fact is, we all fail at times in our lives. Every single one of us falls down. We all fall short of the mark. We all make decisions at times that end in failure. And it is in those most difficult moments that we have to choose what the future is going to look like. Are we going to shut down, give up, walk away because we failed? Or will we renew our focus and commitment to rely on God's voice once again, to rely on God's plan once again, and to rely on God's word more than ever before? Because I'm telling you, those are life-shaping decisions. Those are the decisions that shape our future and determine our path going forward. See, by God's grace, because of his mercy, you get to choose. You can either allow failure to define you, or you can allow failure to refine you. That's a choice you have to make, but make no mistake, it's your choice to make and yours alone. No one can make that choice for you. You can either allow failure to define you, Or you can allow failure to refine you. When facing that very same decision, Joshua chose to renew his commitment to God and the results speak for themselves. So ask yourself, especially if you're you're wrestling today with something in your life, with a, a past failure maybe, ask yourself, am I really going to allow this failure to define me? Or am I willing to swallow my pride, admit my mistake, make things right, and allow that failure to make me better, stronger, wiser, more successful tomorrow? than I was today. So you you can have success after failure, as long as you're willing to allow it to work in your life as God intended it to, which is precisely why he allows us to fall in the first place, because he loves us. And he wants us to learn to rely on him in everything, even and especially in our failures. Let's pray.